Welcome to the Real Estate Espresso Podcast, your morning shot of what's new in the world of real estate investing. I'm your host, Victor Manash. Happy first of the month. On the first day of each month, we review the book of the month. In order to be considered for book of the month, a book has to meet a very simple criteria. It has to be impactful enough that it will either change your life or your perspective on the world. Of course, whether it does or not is entirely up to you. If you consume it as a piece of entertainment, you're missing the point. But if you can internalize its messages and make it part of you, you have a realistic shot at lasting change. Our book this month is definitely worthy of book of the month. Our book this month is called Zero to One by Peter Thiel. Peter has developed a reputation in Silicon Valley for being a shoot entrepreneur. He's innovated in several industries. It's rare enough to do it once, but to hit multiple home runs in a business lifetime is really rarefied error. So when he wrote a book, I had to read it. I had to understand how Peter Thiel thinks. He started PayPal back in 1998. He led it as CEO and then took it public in 2002, defining a new era of fast and secure online commerce. In 2004, he made the first outside investment in Facebook, which he still serves as a director. That same year, he launched Palantir Technologies, a software company that harnesses computers to empower human analysts in fields like national security and global finance. He's provided early funding for LinkedIn, for Yelp, and dozens of other successful technology startups. Many of them are run by former colleagues who have been called the PayPal Mafia. He's a partner at Founders Fund, a Silicon Valley venture capital firm that has funded several companies, including SpaceX and Airbnb. He started the Teal Fellowship, which ignited a national debate encouraging young people to put learning before schooling. And he leads the Teal Foundation, which works towards advancing technical progress and long-term thinking about the future. Now, this book did not disappoint. He shone a light on how he views the world of business from the perspective of an entrepreneur looking to solve business problems and to aggregate enough revenue from the food chain to have a significant and successful business. In the book, Peter grapples with questions like, are monopolies desirable? Is competition good? You might reflexively think you know the answers to these questions, and he will definitely challenge that thinking. Breakthrough businesses are not copies of existing businesses done better. Every moment in business happens only once. The next Bill Gates will not build an operating system, the next Larry Page won't make a search engine, and the next Mark Zuckerberg won't create a social network. If you're copying those guys, you're not learning from them. Of course, it's easier to copy a model than to make something new. Doing something that we already know how to do takes the world from 1 to N, adding more of something familiar. But every time we create something new, we go from 0 to 1. The act of creation is singular, as is the moment of creation, and the result is something fresh and new. Unless you invest in the difficult task of creating new things, companies will fail in the future no matter how big their profits might be today. In the book, he states that all happy companies are different. Each one earns a monopoly by solving a unique problem. All failed companies are the same. That is, they fail to escape competition. So he has this idea called creative monopoly, which means new products that benefit everybody and sustainable profits for the creator. Competition means no profits for anybody, no meaningful differentiation, and a continual struggle for survival. So why is it that people believe competition is healthy? The answer is that competition is not just an economic concept. More than anything else, competition is an ideology. It's an ideology that pervades our society and distorts our thinking. We preach competition. We internalize its necessity. We enact its commandments, and as a result, we trap ourselves in it. Even though the more we compete, the less we gain. Our education system drives and reflects our obsession with competition. Grades themselves allow precise measurement of each student's competitiveness. Students with the highest marks, they receive status and accolades. Students who don't learn best by sitting at a desk are made somehow to feel inferior, while children who excel in that environment, on conventional measures like tests and assignments, end up having their identity wrapped up in that ladder. And it gets worse as students ascend to higher levels of academic achievement. But real breakthroughs require contrarian thinking. Not just any contrarian thinking, but a very specific kind of thinking. It involves questions like, what important truth do few people agree with you on? I mean, that's a very deep question. What important truth do very few people agree with you on? The key word in that question is the word truth. If we already understand as much of the natural world as we ever will, and if everything innovative has already been done, then there's no good answers to those questions. Contrarian thinking doesn't make any sense unless the world still has secrets left to give up. There's another variation on that contrarian question. What valuable company is waiting to be built? 
Once you have the business opportunity of a lifetime, there's still many opportunities for failure. If a company made formative mistakes in the beginning, fixing them later is virtually impossible. Do you have the right makeup of the founding team? And through all of this, Peter shares his perspective as a venture capitalist in Silicon Valley. One of the areas that's received a lot of attention is the green tech, clean tech movement. Most clean tech companies crash because they neglected one or more of seven questions that every business has to answer. And these questions are so powerful. Question number one is, can you create a breakthrough technology instead of just incremental improvements? Then the next question relates to timing. Is now the right time to start that specific business? Number three is the monopoly question. Are you starting with a big share of a small market? If you can't get a dominant position in a small market, there's no point trying to get a small percentage of a large market. Number four, the people question. Do you have the right team? Number five, you've got a distribution question. Do you have a way to not just create the product, but to deliver the product to market? Number six, the durability question. Will your market position be defensible 10 and 20 years into the future? And number seven, the secret question. Have you identified any unique opportunities that others don't see? If you don't have good answers to these questions, you're going to run into lots of bad luck and your business is going to fail. If you nail all seven, you probably will succeed. Even getting five or six might still work. But if you look back through history, you'll see that people were starting companies often with zero good answers to those questions. And all that meant is they were just hoping for a miracle. Now I have to tell you, this was not the most brilliantly book I've ever read. But it asked a lot of important questions that if you apply them to your business will help you build a better business. For that, I'm really grateful for having invested the time in reading the book, Zero to One by Peter Thiel. As you think about that, have an awesome rest of your weekend. Go make some great things happen. We'll talk to you again tomorrow.